Hey, hey people, welcome back to the Game Dev for Math series. In these videos, we go over math that I found practical for game dev using concrete examples. And in this episode, we're doing a function schmogesport, meaning I'm just going to talk about a bunch of little functions and operations that I think are just nice to know. And just due to the fact that we're not covering any topic in depth this episode, this is going to be shorter than the last two, but you can tell that by looking at the runtime. And also this week, we'll be looking at the demo of my friend Lab's game, Aether. We're also cracking open my favorite FOSS application, Blender 3D. Blender, along with Unreal, Unity, and Godot, have a nice node-based shader editor, so I'll be using that to visually demonstrate how these functions work. A quick rundown for anyone unfamiliar with computer graphics, specifically shaders. Colors are represented as four 0 through 1 values, the first three, of course, handle red, green, and blue, and the fourth controls transparency or alpha, R, G, B, and A. Of course, we can use values under zero or over one, but things become unpredictable, so let's not. Black is, of course, R, G, B, A equal to zero, 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 and one. Then white is R, G, B, A equal to one, 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 and so on for all of the other colors. In Aether, at night or in the dark, there's a circle of light cast about the player that has fuzzy edges as if obscured by fog. I'm quite smitten with this effect. A lot of spooky games do something similar with flashlights, so for this episode, let's consider how we would make it. First we have our circle of light. I just made a basic radial gradient, because one, art is hard, and two, we can do all of the heavy lifting with math. So first off. This plain gradient is kind of boring. It definitely doesn't look like a flashlight. We're going to change that using two ways. First, the approach I don't like that much, then the one that I would use personally. Of course, we know the black at the outside of the circle is zero, and the white at the center is one. So we can linearly interpolate from a new value that will be our new black, and a new value that will be our new white. And to do that, we use the function lerp. Unfortunately, Blender doesn't have lerp, so I'll just be using the map range node. But for those of you using Unity, Unreal, or Godot, use lerp. Of course, I want to keep all my values between 0 and 1, so we will take the output of lerp and clamp it between 0 and 1 using clamp. This lets us set both the upper and lower bounds with just one function. However, since clamping between 0 and 1 comes up so frequently in shaders, we can and should use saturate instead of clamp. Saturate is just like clamp, except it is hard-coded to 0 and 1. Now we can adjust the arguments in the lerp function to change how the flashlight looks pretty easily. Now for the exact same thing, but differently. Instead of using linear interpolation and saturate, I like to use smooth step. Linear interpolation is kind of boring since it's just a straight line between the values, whereas smooth step gives us a curvier interpolation. As an added bonus, it automatically saturates the output, so it's a little less typing if you're writing HLSL and a little less spaghetti if you're using nodes. Also, look at the formula. We can differentiate it, but that's a topic for a future video. So if we use smooth step, we can also change the boring radial gradient into something that looks a little more like a flashlight as well. Easy peasy. Next, let's try adding a bit of fog that obscures the outsides of the flashlight. Of course, we want a bit of moving fog for extra drama and tension. It's a nice soulful touch and I like it. We have our nice flashlight, but now we need a way to apply set effect to just the outside of the circle, where it's transitioning from light to darkness. And just like with the earlier part, there are many ways to do this, but I'm just going to walk through one but I'll leave it up to you to try out and discover other ways of doing it. First, a little review from last week. If we quickly sketch out a sine curve, we see that between zero and pi, it starts at zero, then goes up to one, and back to zero. So if we were to multiply the smooth step output by pi, then take the sine of that, we would get a donut. And if we just multiply that by some noise that swooshes around with time, not too fast, we get something nice. After that, we can add our foggy donut with the original smooth step result, saturate it, then multiply that into our flashlight texture, and we get the start of something. But to me, it looks like it needs a little more work. Personally, I think the fog effect should be more intense the farther away it is from the center. So let's try setting that up. I'm going to use Blender's map range node again, so that way the outside of the radial gradient is, let's say, 2 for now and the inside zero. We can always change these values later for different looks. If you're using Unity or Unreal, you'll instead have to use inverse lerp for the same thing. Next, we're going to raise our foggy donut to the power of the reversed gradient. But why? 
Well, x raised to a value has some interesting properties between 0 and 1 for any value greater than 0. Thinking back to the graphing curves in the algebra episode, it's really useful to have the general idea of what some curves look like. In between 0 and 1 for varying exponents, we see the following. For exponents less than 1, it actually curves up towards 1, 1 fairly quickly. Whereas for exponents greater than 1, we see the opposite. And of course, for exponents equal to 1, we just get a straight line. This means that we'll be able to control how quickly the fog effect obscures our light radially by using power. After that, we once again multiply the result with our smooth stepped radial gradient, and I think it's an improvement. Of course, there are as many ways to do this effect as there are grains of sand in the Sahara. So experiment and find what you like best. So let's go over some of the little mathematical amuse-bouches that we covered in this video. We touched upon the interpolation functions, or and smooth step, and also inversely. Then we learned about clamp and saturate, the latter of which is very practical for shaders. But I would be remiss not to mention their counterparts max and min, all of which are means to bound a value within a certain range. Next, we checked out another application of trigonometry. You can use the trig functions to highlight certain value ranges by multiplying by pi, 2 pi, whatever pi the situation calls for. And finally, we checked out powers, and why it's nice to have a general idea of what functions look like. And for any of you interested in Aether, depending on lab schedule, he should be updating the demo soon, or already did. It's a tough game, but I had a lot of fun. It's on Steam for free. See the description for the link. And that's it for this episode. If I inspired any of you to take the plunge into math for a project, let me know. I'd be delighted to check out your work, and if you give me permission, I'd like to share it in these videos. I think that'd just be so cool and would get other people excited about using math as well. Anyways, in two weeks' time, we'll be covering linear algebra, the last video that I think is quote-unquote required for 3D and shader artists. We'll be covering some stuff that I really wanted to talk about today, but just had to wait for linear your algebra. As always, thank you for watching. If you weren't put to sleep by the math, please give this video a like. And if you like this math series or the devlogs of the game I'm slowly working on, please subscribe. Also read all your comments and try to reply, so please keep them coming. I'm amazed that my last video got so many views and my subscriber count grew sevenfold and I'm deeply touched that you all appreciate these videos that much. But you know what they say about giving a mouse a cookie. So please, the channel's not as small, but it's still small, and I would appreciate help with its growth. As always, you can also contact or follow me on Twitter. I post photos of what I bake there, whence I do, unlike here where you have to wait for the next video. And speaking of baking, let's get to it. So I'm still making macaroons, as you can see, and they're yellow because, again, I still have lemons. However, if you haven't picked up already, I'm a bit of a perfectionist when it comes to stuff. So, uh, I mean, you look at the shells. I do have the feet, but the top's not as smooth and, you know, they're called macaroon nipples where you get the little bit in the center. It's a little, I mean, the French invented it, so no surprise, it's kind of naughty. Um, so we'll switch to this uh, filled shot and uh, I filled them with the, I used the proper technique this time. You're supposed to use the buttercream to like hold whatever's kind of goopy in the center in. So I had buttercream on the outside, just plain vanilla buttercream, of course. And then I had lemon curd on the inside and I actually made the lemon curd ahead of time. So it was well set. It was really easy to work with. I think I, I didn't even pipe it in. I just kind of spooned it in cause I'm like, yeah, whatever, whatever. I'm going to squish it down. It's all going to work out. And you can see a little bit seeping out on the sides a little, if you look hard enough. This came out, I mean, this was, uh, the macaron, the shells themselves rose a lot, and that's because, well, if you look inside, well, I have a cross section, so if you look, uh, it's hard to see at the cross section actually because uh, because I'm a master of angle frauding, but the shells are actually a little hollow because I don't think I beat them enough because, you know, I'm still, I'm still pretty new to this, um, but I mean, Look at that. The lemon curd is, was great with the buttercream, so it's a great lemony flavor. And yeah, I mean, they're still like they're still tasty, regardless of if they're not perfect. And the I actually made this. Uh, it was my father's birthday, so I made this ahead of time, gave it to him, and you know he has he has a wicked sweet tooth. It's just 
It's just terrible sweet tooth. So he absolutely loved these. And I mean, he's not too picky about, you know, macaron shells. So, you know, he, he loved them regardless. So yeah, you should, uh, if you, if you can find, set aside the time and, you know, you need a nice little hobby on the side, if you're not doing game dev and you're still not busy enough, uh, you should try, you know, taking up baking. It's a, it's really good. It's a nice little hobby and you can share, you share whatever you make. And it's a, just a great way to show people that you appreciate them and you're thankful to have them in your life. And which, you know, I am, I'm deeply thankful to have my father in my life still. I'm still lucky to have him around. So this was for him. Anyways, I'm going with the classic sign off. The yeast in the air is free. You should take up baking. It's great. It's good for you. It's good for your friends and family too. So yeah. I hope you all have a nice day and see you next time.